and minimalists. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. And today we're going to talk about financial independence. We're going to talk about spending habits. We're going to talk about solving all of your money problems. We're going to talk about fire. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, I find that when we talk about money sometimes, we're often just talking about... <sighs> all the stupid things that we waste our money on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be a reoccurring uh, discussion point today. And we have a guest in the studio today. Travis Shakespeare is here. He's the director of the new documentary, Playing With Fire. You can check it out at playingwithfire.co. We'll be talking more about that as well. But before we dive into today's questions, Travis, can you talk to us about what what is fire? <laughs> Fire, it's so hot. It is, man. It's the hottest thing going. <laughs> you ever seen the sun? Exactly. It's like that, but fiery. Yeah. Um, fire stands for financial independent retired early. So there's a lot of controversy around that phrase that we can get into if you want later. But it's basically... Um, People love to create controversy around everything. Like, they do. Oh, I'd like to retire early. Yeah. You idiot. You idiot. You can't do that. <laughs> totally. Yeah. You're privileged. No, the, yeah. the, the greatest objection is like, so it's basically about a group of millennials who have left mandatory work in their early 30s to 40s mm -hmm. by living very values-driven lives, being frugal in some respects, mm -hmm. and investing very early and very often. Mm -hmm. So you'll typically find like a prototype as like somebody who's like in their 30s and they've got a million dollars in the bank, and now they're living off of the interest uh, and capital gains, which is basically done through something called the 4% rule. So if you have a million dollars invested, you can live off of $40,000 a year mm -hmm. without depleting the portfolio uh, yeah. theoretically in perpetuity. Yeah. But the first thing that people say is, well, why would you want to retire when you're in your 30s? Mm. That's insane. Like, <laughs> don't you want to be slaved, enslaved, and trapped and like chained to your desk like us for the rest of your lives? I think people are often con conflating the idea of retirement and also the idea of of not working. And retiring doesn't necessarily mean I'm never going to work on something I'm passionate about. It means you're not tethered to a, a desk job yeah. or a corporation. You could still do those things if you want to, though, right? That's right. I guess there's just no better word for leaving mandatory work. Right. I mean, if you look at like people throughout history, um, you know, I was talking to one of the British bloggers recently and we kind of happened on the idea that the fire movement is kind of like the agricultural aristocracy of England. So they lived on passive agricultural income. Mm. You know, I mean, a lot of that was generational wealth, which is different from what these folks are doing because most right. of them aren't inheriting money. Um, but these are the people who wrote policy, who wrote novels, who did playwriting, you know, like, I mean, these are the people who contributed a great deal to culture, but they didn't have a mandatory job mm -hmm. in the traditional yeah, sense. Right. And they may have not been like driving Rolls Royces. Exactly. I mean, obviously not back then. Well, no. <laughs> I mean, only if they were really lucky. Right, right, right. Exactly. All right, well, let's go ahead and dive into some questions today. Our first question is from Melissa in Delaware. I am in uh, quite a bit of debt, living paycheck to paycheck and using pretty much all of your pay for rent and bills. How do you necessarily get out of debt when you're living this way? And for years, I've always put it off and said, okay, well, one day I'm going to make a lot more money, and that's when I'll be able to pay off debt. And I found that I've just been saying that for so many years that, I don't know how many more years I will be saying that because I've been living paycheck to paycheck for a long time and I can't quite get out of this cycle. So what is the best way to get out of debt when you're not making enough money to pay the debt off and you're only making enough money to make ends meet? Dude, I used to have that ex same exact attitude. Like when I was making, you know, minimum wage or I think eventually I got a job, I was making like 10 bucks an hour. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to worry about saving for retirement right now. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to worry about paying off any debt uh, because one day I'm going to make fifty thousand dollars a year. And I don't have a plan to get there. Right. But I. It's going to happen eventually. There's some hypothetical future where I'm right. going to make unlimited amounts of money. I don't know how, but of course it's going to happen because I'm awesome. And then I started making fifty thousand dollars a year. And what did I do? I'm like, oh, this isn't enough money. I, a, I took on more debt. 
<laughs> and then I just like perpetuated the lie of like, oh, no, no. when I make $90,000 a year, that's when I'll be able to live debt free. Mm. Now, now, Travis, you probably see this. A few words that stood out to me. In fact, if I were to rephrase Melissa's question, I, I would just say, how do I achieve financial freedom when my entire paycheck is eaten up by bills? And those bills for her, she, she, she says they pay for the basics, right? You know, she, she used some words like debt. She used words like living paycheck to paycheck, but also acknowledging that she wants to get out of debt. I imagine that you stumble across a lot of people who are saying, well, financial independence is, is so far out of reach for me because I can't even, I can't even get out of debt at this point. Yeah. I mean, my personal story was I was still in a lot of debt by the age of 40 years old. So I was $40,000 in student loan debt at 9% interest mm. because I consolidated uh, when they told me that the interest rates were the lowest I would ever see in my lifetime. Mm. I was in credit card debt and I was living the lottery mentality that someday somebody was going to just shower me with money, like you said, because I'm awesome. <laughs> And it took my father passing away and me inherit, he was a school teacher. So I inherited a small amount of money, about $75,000. That was my big payday, right? This was the I'm awesome. That yeah. was the I am awesome yeah. moment. And I'm very grateful for, you know, what he did in terms of uh, saving that money and passing it on to me. But for the first time in my life, I was debt free. So I am completely empathetic to people who have racked up a lot of debt and seem to be very much under that. And it's just very hard to get out from under, um, particularly when you look at things like credit cards that are charging you between 20 and 30 percent interest, which is just insane. Yeah. And I think that people don't really understand what that means. I think if you put that money, if you put $10,000 into a calculator at 30% interest and run it for 10 years into the future and look at what that actually means, maybe you'll think twice before you lay your credit card down for another pair of shoes. Or you yeah. sign up for a new credit card because, oh, I'd be dumb not to. It saves me 15% on this Banana Republic pair of khakis. Right. Exactly. So to you know to be fair once you're already in a lot of debt and that's where this society loves to keep us mm -hmm. um you are already at a disadvantage mm -hmm. so your options are to earn more money yep um and reduce your spending that yes <laughs> and now on this podcast we give simple advice but simple is not easy no. simple is very very difficult in fact that's what i love about the documentary you guys did uh with playing with fire like you've got Scott and you've got Taylor who are living this lavish lifestyle. They make the decision that they want to save more money. So that's exactly what they do. They uh, find out a way to uh, reduce their uh, costs at first. And it shows this process of them doing that. And it's real. It's not like this very happy fairy tale story of like, oh, we decided to be financially independent, and now we are. End of movie. Like it's a beautiful story about the struggle of doing that, and and that's really what I want to tell Melissa is like, Melissa, it's going to be very very hard for you to get out from underneath of that debt. But yes, those two things, making more money. There's no shame in driving for Uber or delivering pizzas or whatever, taking on some kind of side gig. There's no shame in getting a second job temporarily to kind of help get yourself above water. And yeah, I mean, what do we used to tell our employees, Josh, when they asked for a pay raise? Yeah, the quickest way to give a pay raise is to spend less money. <laughs> right. And and uh, that was really the plan. In fact, Sean, if you could put a link in the show notes to this episode to an essay I wrote a few years ago about financial freedom. Uh, it was a, a, a five-step plan, but it was specifically titled Five Difficult Steps to Get Out of Debt, right? And, and difficult because it is simple, but it can still be difficult mm -hmm. to do. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I didn't have, uh, my, my mother died, um, I was 28, and she left me $2.39, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> which wasn't Did enough. you put it all on black and it, lose it? It wasn't enough to pay off my six figures worth of debt. Uh, and so I, I had, I made really good money in the corporate world throughout my 20s, spent even better money, and as a result had amassed a lot of debt. Because I had a, a good job, or ostensibly good job, people were willing to give me lines of credit. And so I was always spending more than I made. I was, I was making great money, but still living, like Melissa, paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. And I thought, well, like Ryan thought, well, I'll have to make more money eventually. I'll, I'll become a CEO, but, or, or COO, or, or 
it, it didn't matter. I, I was not making enough money and I had accumulated a lot of debt. And so I had to come up with a plan. Uh, and that plan involved the two things that you just said. I had to make more money. And I did some things, even when I was in the corporate world, I was, I was this is before Uber, but uh, I was delivering pizzas mm -hmm. to pay off credit card debt. Uh, in evenings and, and weekends, uh, I was starting to sell everything. eBay and Craigslist became my best friend. Anything that was sort of in the house that I was not using, it was great for the minimalism thing too because I was starting to, to pare down and getting, getting rid of these things that no longer added value to my life. I wasn't selfishly clinging anymore. I was letting go of those things, making pennies on the dollar from what I paid for them, but I wasn't getting any value from them at all. And so that was another way for me to make more money. But ultimately, the best pay raise I ever gave myself was to live within my means mm -hmm. and then actually really live below my means. When I walked away from the corporate world, I took about a 90% pay cut. I made $23,000 that first year, but I was actually more financially secure because I was making better decisions with a little bit of money and the other resources uh, I did have. And so if I'm talking to Melissa, I'm going to say, hey, money is one resource, but mm -hmm. what are your other resources? Your time, your attention, your energy, your skills, your talent. These are things that you can also use to earn more income, especially as you're trying to pay off debt. I actually applaud you for feeling the pain that you're feeling right now, Melissa. Yeah. She's asking the right questions. Yeah. Yeah. That pain is actually good. This pain is, is leading you toward, oh, I need to have some sort of behavioral change because this debt is not good. I don't like this anymore. I don't want to feel this way. I want to feel different. And I find that people in the FIRE community feel a lot different. They feel free. They do feel free. I mean, you know, debt is something that is like a ball and chain. And I mean, I, I really think people like Melissa have to start considering debt like a poison because it is a kind of poison in your life. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it's a spiritual poison. Um, and the fire movement has figured out a way to sort of cleanse themselves of that poison um, by taking their power back. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, well, what, what I love about the, the documentary, too, is it's not just a bunch of like rich millennials who are retiring early. I mean, it's 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 your everyday people. I mean, yeah, they're making more than minimum wage, but, you know, they're not bringing in six figures a year. And that's how they're becoming financially independent. It's it's like your everyday uh, family, uh, two or three, four person family that is able to become financially independent. There's one thing though. There's one step I think we're skipping over here with Melissa. What's that? She has got to put a budget together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, I have people email me. Well, when I was, uh, taking on new mentoring clients, I still mentor, but I'm not taking on new clients, but, uh, people would email me. They'd be like, Ryan, I am so poor. I can't afford your mentoring, but I really need your mentoring. And I'm like, I will give it to you for free. Please send me your budget, <laughs> put your budget together and let me see it. And then I will absolutely give you free mentoring. I have not had one person take me up on that. <laughs> and then wow. I, I had I had one friend who was complaining to me about money, and I was like, you know, I'd love to help you. Let me see your budget. And she's like, Ryan, that's insulting. I'm poor. I don't need a budget to know that I'm poor. Hmm. And I'm like, if you don't know how poor you are, though, like you're doing yourself a disservice. So, Melissa, step one is you've got to get clear on what your budget is. That is going to help you know exactly where your money is going. The other thing I want to mention to Melissa is you got to find leverage to spend less money or to make more money. But I'll tell you one thing. Um, I know in your documentary, uh, Vicki Robbins talks about this a little bit, Your Money, Your Life. Uh, she wrote that book back in like the early 90s, late 80s. I mean, yeah, yeah it was. it's a great book. But She has a new version of it out, I believe. Oh, right? yeah, she yes. does. She mentions yeah. the, men, the men's game in it. That's right. Yeah, yeah so uh, yeah, check that book out for sure. Uh, your Money, Your Life. You can put that in the show notes, Sean, if you don't mind. But you've got to find leverage to be able to spend less money. So what Vicky did, like she was on Oprah back in the day and she had this like rack of clothes and she's like, look at this jacket. This jacket was $400. It was on sale for a hundred. You were stupid not to buy it. Mm -hmm. But this hundred dollar jacket, if you're making eight bucks an hour, I mean, you're working a day and a half. You're giving up, you know, 10 hours of your time or 12 hours of your time to buy this jacket. So Melissa, with every purchase that you make, like you've got to be able to look at that cup of coffee and say, oh man, this is four dollars of my time. I mean, if, if you're making a minimum wage in Delaware, that's like eight seventy-five, and after taxes, that's like eight dollars. I mean, you're working a half hour for that cup of coffee or for that twenty-dollar meal. You're working three hours. You've got to be able to put it in that perspective to to motivate yourself to spend less. I mean, uh, little tricks like that will help. Is there any other there, leverage you think? There's actually the, the biggest leverage points are housing, transportation, and food. Mm. 
So housing is, if you look at your budget, that's always the biggest chunk. So whatever you can do to reduce your housing, like people are like, oh, well, just stop, just stop buying lattes. You know, you're not going to become a millionaire right. by just stop buying lattes. Mm -hmm. But if you can get your housing costs under control and your transportation costs under control, that's the big ticket item. Mm. So it may require sacrifice. Somebody like Melissa, I mean, listen, when I lived, when I first moved to LA, like I had roommates forever, mm. like literally forever, because this is an expensive city. But by maintaining a roommate situation, it allowed me to save a ton of money. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's time to get a roommate or if you can find a way to she's probably not in this position, but a lot of the fire people will buy a duplex and they'll find a really cheap duplex and they'll renovate one side and they'll live in the other side and mm. basically have somebody else paying their mortgage. Yeah. You know, and then transportation, like this culture loves to tell you that you need a new car every three years or something, right? Yeah. Um, nobody needs a new car ever, actually. You can get, <laughs> you can get by on, you know, a $5,000 car pretty much anywhere and it's a reliable safe piece of transportation you know yeah. so you look at that and then food costs obviously are, are that's that's where you can really like adjust you know what you're doing because you know mr money mustache who's one of the core uh financial pioneers yeah. of the financial independence <laughs> movement um has this one post that i love which basically breaks down your food cost by calorie mm. like he's such an engineering nerd that he's optimized like how many almonds you know, you need to eat every day, you know, to get your protein in. And, you know, it's only like this many pennies, oh, you know, man. on the dollar. I'm going to have to find that. It's a great it post, That's actually. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Melissa, I'm going to send you a copy of our book, Essential. There's 12 different chapters in here on the 12 different areas of, well, 12 areas that Ryan and I identified. It's an essay collection, 150 different essays, breaking down the 12 categories of intentional living. And one of those chapters, one of those categories has to do with finances. So I think you'll find a lot of value in the financial chapter as well as the other chapters. If you like our podcast, you'll like the audiobook version of that. So Sean, if you could reach out to Melissa, send her the audiobook, or if you want the book book or the ebook, we're happy to send those to you as well. Ryan, what time is it? It is time for our lightning round where we answer questions from social media. Indeed we do. So we're at The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And during the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I do our best to answer every question with just a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We also put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you like. And now you can find all of these quotes in one place thanks to our good friend Jessica Lynn Williams over at minimalmaxims.com. Now, Travis, what we actually do is we maunder on a bit. We ramble and then... Uh, Sean tweezes out something pithy. Like a moment ago, you said uh, you said debt is, what did you say, a spiritual? I uh, said it's a spiritual poison. Debt, debt is, is a spiritual yeah. poison. Put that in the show notes podcast, Sean. <laughs> What's our first question, Ryan? Our first question is from Ian. What advice do you have for someone working a minimum wage job and wants to save and invest in the money that the person earns? Well, um, my, my pithy answer here is we can't maximize life with minimum effort. Now, minimum wage job doesn't mean there's necessarily minimum effort here. I, I've worked several minimum wage jobs. Likewise. That, yeah, uh, uh, as a dishwasher, busboy. There was a lot of effort there. What I mean by, by this is we do need to put in effort to earn more money uh, if, if we're working a minimum wage job. I don't think minimum wage jobs are necessarily meant to sustain us long term. In fact, uh, we've had TK Coleman on the podcast four different times now, and he is an advocate of actually ab abolishing the minimum wage. He thinks that the minimum wage was, was created because of, uh, well, there are racist reasons that, that the minimum wage was, was created. And mm. We could dive into that some other time with him, I'm sure. Um, but his point is that um, the minimum wage is 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 not what we should be striving for. We should not be striving for the minimum. One, one other pithy answer here is money isn't everything, but it's also not nothing. Uh, <laughs> I think too often we are, we are um, driven by money. And I'm actually finding that people in, in the fire community in particular, it seems like it's driven by money at first because that's the ostensible subject, right? But it's, it's just the opposite of that. It's driven by values of living a, a more intentional, well-rounded, meaningful life. And we do need some money to do that. But of course, we don't need all the money in the world to do that. We don't need a billion dollars in order to be happy. 
No, I mean, actually, the genius of the movement is that they've they figured out that time is the most important thing in life, mm. right? And it, money is infinite, right? It literally is infinite. Sure. I mean, we print more and more every day, like as if, you know, it doesn't make any difference. Right. It's like YouTube videos. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly true. <laughs> um, but time is finite. You know, we don't know how much time we have left on the planet. And uh, Scott and Taylor in, in our film, for instance, you know, they, what triggered them was that they had a baby. And they were like, wait a minute, we're spending every single work hour of our day working to support the lifestyle that we think that we should have, which is taking away all this precious time from our, our, us with our little girl. And by the way, that's a lifestyle that probably other people think they should have. And that's mm -hmm. why you think you should have it. We, and and, and it's, we've been marketed to 5,000 marketing messages a day if you live in a big city, uh, 500,000 discrete bits of input every day. We're, we're, we're constantly barraged by, by um, these. Other, yeah, other people's ideas. Uh, yeah, other people's right. ideas <laughs> of how we should live our life. So quite often it isn't like, that's the life I really want. That is the life that someone else wants, so I should want it too. That's right. I mean, it's, a, it's just indoctrination through advertising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so so if if we're giving Ian advice here, he works minimum wage. I mean, the simple advice is you, you have to you have to earn more money at this point. Yeah, I mean, and that doesn't mean go quit your job tomorrow, Ian, but it does mean like find a way to move on to something else or even if you got to get like a second part-time job or something. Uh, again, like that spend less, earn more, like that's how you're going to be able to save. My pithy answer is it's really going back to the budget. It's nearly impossible to save money if you don't have a detailed budget and if you're making minimum wage, I would say that you need a budget more than most people because well, your resource is limited. When we're talking about budgeting, really what you're talking about is how do I allocate my resources? Right. And a calendar is a way to budget your time. The most important resource it, for me, uh, I actually think attention is your most uh, precious resource. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a it's sort of a subset of time in a way, right? It's like, because we all have the same amount of time in a day, we have 24 hours, how we spend it, our attention, what energy we give to these things is really how I'm budgeting my time. Mm -hmm. So how are you budgeting your time right now? Are you using your time to maybe develop some skills that will aid you in the workplace later? Are you using your, your time and your attention to, to read more and Instead of pacifying yourself so that ultimately you're going to develop into a, a person who does command a, a greater income. It's not about going out tonight, finding the better job, but there are ways, there are sort of side hustles. We've had Chris Gillibo on the podcast, his, his book about and his, and his podcast about side hustles. These are people who aren't trying to earn a full-time living, but setting up intentional side hustles to yeah. earn additional income so that you can be more financially independent. Yeah, like if you can make 100 or 200 bucks extra a month, I mean, that goes a long way. Um, and the budget also, it's not a, it's not this magic bullet answer. It's not like, oh, now you have a budget and now everything, everything's fine. That's just like the first step to this very, very difficult process. It's about noticing. Yeah, absolutely. And Sean, please put a link to every dollar. I mean, that's the budgeting app that Mariah and I use. We've got an account that we share. Uh, it's Dave Ramsey's tool. Um, it is, it's one of my favorite budgeting apps that I use. Do you have a budgeting app that, that you would recommend? I Anything? just use a spreadsheet. Yeah. I actually just use a pencil and paper. Yeah. So, I, so that's what Mariah and I <laughs> used to do. And the spreadsheet, it does work. Um, every dollar I like it just cause you can kind of, it's just a little bit, but for me, um, it's a little, just a little bit better than a spreadsheet, but for some people, the spreadsheet might work better. Whatever it is, just get a budget. I think that the apps are kind of useful because they gamify yeah the whole thing actually, which i think is actually very useful because you're tricking your brain into a dopamine hit mm -hmm. like one of the things that i loved when i was early on in my path to financial independence was every time i put a dollar in the bank i got like a little dopamine hit mm -hmm. and it actually became sort of addictive i was like oh wow i'm up to 10 bucks i'm up to a thousand dollars and you know by the when you hit ten thousand you're like whoa yeah like i'm killing it right now yep. you know it's a very exciting feeling I have totally one agree. suggestion based on what you were saying about time and attention, um, which is education. Um, you know, it's very easy to say to somebody who has a minimum wage, go out and, and get another job. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people are killing themselves. Let's face it. Like, right. you know, if you're riding the bus and like <laughs> making, I don't even know what the minimum wage average on average is now. It's like 12 bucks an hour or something. No, I, oh, Eight? the average, I don't know the average. I know federal minimum wage is like 750. I mean, 750. That's federal. Yeah. We live in California, so we're a little better right, off. Right. Yeah. But um, but it's still really, really tough. Now, if instead of, if you could 
take a chunk of your time and try to educate yourself into another skill. Mm. You know, like if you're working at McDonald's and getting another job is an option, but instead of taking that time to get another job, you spend six months learning how to become a welder Mm -hmm. Mm. or something that's a tangible skill or coding or whatever it is that you can then make the leap. Um, I think that that to me would be a long-term solution to to the short-term problem of being stuck as working poor, basically. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, yeah, just saying get a second job, that is easier said than done. And one thing I would add to that is don't confuse schooling with education. There are many ways to, to gain an education without going for you know, the proper four-year degree. In fact, many four-year degrees do not yield... Um, uh, more income necessarily. A, a lot of them might, you know, if you're going to to go to school for nursing or, or or some of these fields that are in high demand. But there are other fields that require maybe a training program or, or some sort of vocational school or or um, uh, maybe just an apprenticeship. Apprenticeship. You can go down to your your dad's friend who knows how to fix cars, you know, and like just offer to help for free in order to learn, you know, the mechanics. And yeah. next thing you know. You can end up working at BMW as, you know, a, a staff mechanic. Those guys make really good money, Great actually. Money. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Prima writes, why would someone need to be financially independent if they're a minimalist? And what is the first baby step to start the journey toward financial independence? Well, my short answer here is money won't solve all your problems, but it will solve your money problems. Uh, she's asking about the baby steps here. I mean, the, the first baby step is before you even get to what Dave Ramsey might even call the baby steps, right? Um, is having a budget, but then being debt free was really ultimately the, the, the first step toward financial independence for me. In order to uh, travel in the direction you want to travel, you first must get out of the crater that you're in. And, and, and that for me was like really getting laser focused on paying off debt to get out of that crater, and then you can determine what does financial independence look like for me. Travis, what do you, what do you think about, about, I mean, obviously getting out of debt, but then where do, where do folks go from there? I think that those three big ticket items, the housing, the transportation, and the food, I think that's, that's where you want to really get your budget under control. Um, and then the other genius of the financial independence movement is to invest early and invest often. So... Every 10 years, whatever money you've got invested will basically double. Mm. But that also means that every 10 years you wait to invest means that you have to double your savings. Right. Mm. Right? So if you wait until you're 40, like I did, and, you know, have a decent job finally, you're you're having to – I had to save uh, to four times the amount of money that I would have if I started saving when I was in my 20s in order to reach the same – end point, right? Mm, At 65, if I had a traditional retirement. Mm -hmm. So if I could tell my younger self one thing, even if I only had $5 or $20 to invest a month, it's worth it. It absolutely is because that's the magic of compound interest. Right. The, the, if you're 25 years old and then you invest $25 a week, you're going to end up with roughly a, a million dollars by the time you are 65 if you get a, a good interest rate and everything sort of works out well. But that is because of compound interest. Now, obviously, you'll want to be able to invest more than that and hopefully retire even sooner than that. But but that tells me that even if you're working minimum wage and you're able to set aside $25 a week, the beauty, the magic of compound interest means that you're going to be so much better off and your future self is going to thank you as a result. Einstein called it the eighth natural wonder of the world or something like that. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, minimalism uh, doesn't mean you're you're poor or you live without money. I mean, uh, minimalists are not necessarily allergic to money. So uh, my pithy answer is money isn't everything, but it is necessary even for minimalists. Yes, indeed. All right, looks like we have a bunch more surprise questions this week about a specific plan to pay off debt, about different budgeting methods, about charitable giving on a budget, about transportation expenses, about going into debt for your passion, about mortgages, and many, many, many more questions. In fact, Ryan, we got a record number of questions. I don't even think we can get to all of them. Also, we have an article here, 11 Steps to Retire by Age 50. 
And if you want to hear all that, you can listen to this week's Maximal episode available exclusively on Patreon. That's right. You're currently listening to our weekly Minimal episode, but each week Ryan and I record an entirely different long-form Maximal episode on the Minimalist private podcast, which gives us the private space we need to talk about topics we don't usually discuss in public. Plus, Patreon is the best way for us to fund this podcast and keep it 100% advertisement free. When you subscribe to the Minimalist private podcast on Patreon, you'll also receive a personal link so that our maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. Find all the details and all the good stuff over at theminimalists.com slash support. Also, it's probably worth noting that we are now capping our Patreon support, 6,000 people, and we're more than halfway there at this point. And uh, by the way, our patrons have doubled over the last four or five months. And so we'll, we'll be getting there relatively soon. We're trying to keep it a private space, and we've identified what is enough for us. And 6,000 people is enough. It's enough to pay Podcast Sean and Jordan No More and Jessica and also ourselves and never pepper our podcast with advertisements. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? As always, being informed is more important than ever, especially with something like finances or being financially independent. I mean, you know, like I said on the podcast, we give simple advice, but simple ain't easy. So go get a book and and figure out what you can do to help yourself become financially independent. I know a great starting point is Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover. That book's going to help you get out of debt. So I want to encourage people who are listening to this to read more and get informed. And also, Josh, I got some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. Hey, minimalists. This is Christina calling from Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. I just listened to your career podcast and wanted to call to say how much I loved it. I think it's so important to find what you're passionate about and just go for it. Kind of continue to cultivate that passion and push through the low parts. I actually started writing a fashion blog back in 2013, and it's continued to grow from there. I studied to be a style coach and launched my own side business this past November, and now I work one-on-one with people to develop their own personal style. I've always been passionate about promoting local shopping in my community, but I realized after listening to the podcast that I'm going to focus even more on teaching my clients on how to shop according to their values, more eco-friendly, and really help them minimize their closets. I just wanted to thank you guys for helping me realize this and for all you guys do. Hi, guys. This is Marley in Cleveland, Tennessee, and I am a newbie to your podcast, and I've already hooked. Maybe it's because you spoke about one of my favorite subjects, creativity. I want to share how liberating it is that you give people permission to practice failing. When I learned the wisdom that the brick wall of frustration is the part of the creative process, it set me free. Once I knew that this was part of the process, I could know where I was and go on to the next steps of incubating my creative idea, strategizing new ideas, and collaborating with others. So at that brick wall of frustration, I didn't quit and go home, but I kept at it, seeing it through to the success moments. Also, a tip on the have to versus the get to in your creative process One inquiry you could ask is the EEE test. Does this have ease, not to be confused with easy, because our life's creativity isn't always easy, but does it flow with ease? Does it have great energy, and do I enjoy it? That's when you know in your bones that you are doing something you love. All right, y'all. Thanks again to Travis Shakespeare for joining us today. Check out his new documentary, Playing With Fire. You can find all the details. Learn more over at playingwithfire.co. And real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. Have you checked out our side project? It's called minimalism.life. And the website is (laughs) minimalism.life. Yes, apparently that is an extension. For those of you who don't know, I, I printed this out, Ryan, because... We've been we, we have a, a team of writers over there who have been doing a phenomenal job on the journal side of things. So for those of you who don't know what minimalism dot life is, it's a it's curating the best of simple living. So like well being, that's uh, Ryan's and mine's wheelhouse, but also minimalist design and uh, so it could be like architecture or other design aspects. Our friend Carl from Minimalissimo is over there, and also minimalist travel. 
uh, Alberto from Five Style. So we all three teamed up, and we have a team of writers over there who are also writing about these topics. And uh, you can find that in our journal. You can get on the email list over there. You can just go to minimalism.life. You can find all of these journal articles as well. Here's a few of them. One is called The Next Step. The Next Step. There's one called Be Aware. There's one called The Renegade Minimalist. The Elephant in the Room. Techno Minimalist. Curating a Natural Home. You Don't Need Much to Be Happy. Controlling the Floodgates. The Trouble with Clothes. Discussing Space a life edited, and many, many more. There's also something over there called Inside Minimalism. You can check that out. Also, a bunch of free wallpapers for your phone or for your tablet or your computer. Check all of those out at minimalism.life. You can also follow Minimalism Life on Twitter and Instagram and uh, check out all the beautiful curated photos and words and quotes at Minimalism Life. And new stuff comes out each week. If you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, leave us a voicemail, 406-219-7839, or send a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. If you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails each week. For our added value this week, let's listen to Noah Gunderson's new song. It's called Robin Williams, which perfectly illustrates the the sort of ephemerality, but also <laughs> what, what I think of as like the simultaneous seriousness and absurdity of life. Um, and, and Robin Williams perfectly as a human being encompassed that. I thought about this because we did that episode with, with uh, Jamie Kilstein recently, and he was good friends with, with Robin Williams. And life is simultaneously serious. There are things that are serious we have to take seriously. Mm -hmm. But also a lot of life is absurd. And uh, the things that we think are serious are often absurd. And the things that we think are absurd, we should probably take more seriously. And I think a lot of that episode today, the episode today was about that, especially the, the Patreon episode that we recorded with, uh, with Travis. We, we got into some of these things that uh, we could probably better spend our money on, uh, a more serious approach to, to our money. Anyway, here is Robin Williams, the, the new song Robin Williams from Noah Gunnarsson's new album, Lover. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Bye. The Minimalists.